From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. Our colleague Noel is on an adventure, but he will return soon. They call me Ben. We are joined, as always, with our super producer, Paul, Mission Control Deccant. Most importantly, you are you, you are here, and that makes this the stuff they don't want you to know. Uh, Matt, we've said it before on the show, regardless of whether or not you live in the United States yourself, regardless of your personal stance on politics, policy, law enforcement, or even pharmaceutical companies, if you're hearing this, you are being affected by the consequences of a multi-generational war. It's not a war on any specific country, any specific person, even specific ideologies. It's a war on a concept, a war on substances that themselves have no goals, belief, or ideology. You, me, everyone. We're all affected by the war on drugs. But how did we get here? What led us to this point? Where are we collectively now? Where will we be in the future? To answer this question, we wanted to go directly to one of the leaders in this conversation, in this field, Ethan Nadelman. Ethan, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. We're, we're quite excited to speak with you. Hey, my pleasure, Ben, Matt. It's great to see you. Great to meet you, Ben. Oh, yes. So uh, some people may know you from your podcast, Psychoactive. Many others will know your face and your voice from a TED Talk that you gave back in the day. That's God. I don't even know how many millions of views at this point, but uh, a vast majority of the people, if they, if a little bell rings, when they hear Ethan Nadelman, it's because you are the founder of the drug policy Alliance. And I just wonder if you could give us maybe a short rundown uh, of who you are, because I feel like I can't introduce you properly. Sure, man. I'm happy to do that. Well, so I basically spent, uh, uh, most of my adult life working to end the war on drugs. And now I'm going to be 65 in, in a few months. So I, and I've been working on this since my 20s. So, I mean, basically the real synopsis of it is, you know, graduate school, I started studying international drug control, got a security clearance from the State Department, wrote classified report on drug-related money laundering, interviewed drug enforcement agents from the U.S. and other countries all around the world, wrote some books about this issue, became a professor at Princeton in the late 80s, right when the drug war was going absolutely crazy, like McCarthyism on steroids. And I sort of stood up and said, this is crazy. Got a few 15 minutes of fame. There was an emerging drug policy reform movement in those days. A few years later, I get a call out of the blue from a philanthropist uh, and financier named George Soros, uh, who was interested in this issue. We kind of hit it off. So I left Princeton University, started up this institute in 94. Eventually, in 2000, it it merges with another organization, becomes the Drug Policy Alliance. I ran that for 17 years until I stepped down about four years ago. At that point, Drug Policy Alliance was the biggest and leading drug policy reform organization, not just in the U.S., but around the world. And during the course of that, it meant we got deeply involved in things like ballot initiatives to legalize marijuana, first for medical purposes and then more broadly. We got deeply involved in trying to roll back the role of the drug war in mass incarceration. And our other major priority was making a serious commitment to treating drug use and addiction as a health issue, not a criminal issue, which meant everything to try and reduce the spread of AIDS through needle exchange programs to overdose prevention to introducing Americans to cutting edge ideas that were being implemented in Europe and elsewhere. Wow. Okay, so there was so much there. (laughs) <laughs> so many, so many little things that I want to jump on. And uh, Ben, I'm sorry, I don't mean to uh, just take over for a second here, but you, you threw out the name George Soros. And he's one of these guys that just has so many rumors circulating about him because of his, you know, obvious wealth and power. Uh, but like, what was that 
interaction like? I just I'm so curious personally about that because I did I didn't know there was a connection there. Yeah, no, I'll tell you, Matt. I mean, with with George, um, when I first got the call in the summer of '92, almost 30 years ago, uh, you know, he was a guy who wasn't that well known. He was more known for his finance, and but he had been the key philanthropist funding the dissidents and the opposition to socialist dictatorship in former Soviet Union Eastern Europe. And what had happened was communism had fallen much more quickly than he or anybody expected. And he had been the key private individual helping bring about its downfall. He was very committed to the ideals of an open society, right, fighting totalitarianism from the left and the right. And so he then began asking him the question, well, he'd always thought that America was the model of what an open society is, but it now seemed, you know, the question was, what in America was inconsistent with open society ideals. And basically, one of the first things that hit him between the eyes was the war on drugs. And so he reached out. And, you know, at that point, I was all I was a young professor at Princeton, but I was already the most prominent person probably in the world speaking out against the drug war and in favor of looking at things like legalization and decriminalization. And so we got together and we hit it off. And it's funny now to think that, you know, he's now identified as this radical left funder. Um, but in point of fact, when I first met George, I think his politics, in fact, he said so, they were more almost like liberal Republican or what was known in the days as, you guys may not know, but Scoop Jackson was a famous Democrat who, you know, very anti-communist, but kind of progressive on social issues. And George really identified as a kind of Scoop Jackson, human rights Democrat, or maybe liberal Republican, uh, and very much not identified in the way he is now. And so he and I essentially developed a partnership where, you know, he, he agreed to back my start an organization and funding grants programs and doing all sorts of things like that. And in terms of his current reputation, that really began, I'd say, around 2003, when George was simply horrified at the Bush administration's war on terror and all the implications of this thing. He saw what we were doing with the invasion of Iraq. He saw all the rhetoric around the anti-terrorism stuff as really being over the top and not reflective of open society ideals. And it's at that point where he started to get much more politically involved in supporting Democrats. Until that point, he hadn't been much of a player. But if you jump forward now... I mean, he's become a bit more progressive in his views, but what's really gone on is the demonization of Soros by, you know, by the right. I mean, it's notable that if you look, it's not just the people on the right in the United States who demonize Soros. It's Putin, right? You know, it, it's, uh, you know, uh, what's his name? The, pre the, the president of Hungary. It's the right wing authoritarian dictators around the world who hate Soros because he's the one supporting the Orange Revolution and the other revolutions in the former Soviet Union. He's the one fighting for freedom. He's the number one funder of human rights in the world. And fortunately for me, because of, I think, our relationship, because of his commitment, even though his support for drug policy reform has only represented maybe 2% of the billion dollars a year that he and his foundation are giving away, it's always loomed large in his consciousness and especially in the earlier years, I think in the public perceptions of him as well. So, I mean, I think he's, you know, he's now 91. He's still going. He's an extraordinary human being who's going to go down in history um, for, you know, really fighting for open society ideals. And, you know, why he's been demonized, I think what happened is part of it may be the name, Soros, you know, is like a provocative name and everybody can remember <laughs> it. And I think, you know, sending out, uh, you know, sending out, you know, anti-Soros stuff and Soros. And some of it's also playing on anti-Semitism, you know, the notion of, of course, the Jewish yeah. capitalist, the Jewish communist, you know, it goes back to the protocols of the elders of Zion, you know, you know, the famous anti-Semitic tract of the late 19th, early 20th century. So there's some of that going on. It's a shame. It's a shame. But, I mean, if you look at the good, I mean, books are being written about all the good he's done, and it's really extraordinary around the world. And uh, the Koch brothers hate him, which is yeah. always a good sign to me. Well, um, you know, so I'll tell you, Ben, it's a bit complicated because there yeah. are issues like ending the drug war and criminal justice reform and some foreign policy issues where actually George and the Koch brothers, well, now it's no longer the brothers, now it's basically Charles right, since yeah. David died, where they actually see eye to eye on some things. So on a, on a lot of the big issues, they're opposed to one another. But I'll tell you, there was a moment, you know, one of the other famous right-wingers is Grover Norquist, 
you know, the famous anti-tax, let's get government so small we can strangle in a bathtub kind of libertarian approach. But Grover became an ally of mine on ending the drug war because he hates the drug war coming from a libertarian perspective. And I landed up arranging for George Soros to speak to Grover Norquist, you know, Wednesday morning breakfast group of, you know, leading right wingers in America. So so wow. I mean, part of what I've enjoyed has been, you know, this kind of bringing the left and the right together in behalf of a good cause like ending the war on drugs. That's a that's an important point, too, I think, because it is something that requires massive collective action. You know, growing up uh, at the in the generation of people like Matt or myself, the war on drugs was normalized. Right. You were born into this uh, this ongoing conflict with a with a lot of propaganda. You know, we had programs like D.A.R.E. in in public schools and so on. Um, We also had a lot of I think a lot of people in our generation, maybe a lot of people listening today, just hear the phrase war on drugs and immediately have some kind of vague associations, but don't really understand the genesis of the situation uh, that that the U.S. entered into. Earlier, you said McCarthyism on steroids in a, in a specific era of the war on drugs. And that really, that, to me, that, that so astutely nails the situation that so many people grew up in. But I, I think a lot of people have never investigated the origins of this situation, the genesis of the war on drugs. And could you, Ethan, tell us uh, in the audience a little bit about how how this all evolved? Like, um, you know, it, it's, it's a well-known historical fact that for a, a time, things like marijuana, or cocaine or opiates uh, were legal. You could buy an over-the-counter medicinal beverage to, you know, calm a child's toothache. And now those same sorts of substances uh, can lead to draconian prison sentences and things like mandatory minimums. So, so how did the U.S. evolve from that earlier point to the current day? Sure. Well, Ben, I'll, I'll try to make it as, uh, as a thumbnail sketch as much as possible. Basically, if you think about it, as you said, late 19th century, cocaine, opiates, uh, opium, even heroin that is created in the late uh, 1890s, cannabis, they're basically legal um, throughout the United States and many other countries. And then the first prohibitions come about not because there's new evidence of their harms. I mean, that plays a small role. It's more about because of public perceptions of who uses or who is perceived to use these substances. So nobody was going to criminalize, you know, all these over-the-counter opiates. It was called laudanum, this liquid opium, so long as most of the consumers were middle-class white women, you know, in the 1870s, 80s, 90s, because nobody wanted to put, you know, their auntie or grandma behind bars. But when opiates become associated with the Chinese migrants coming in, working long hours on the railroads and the mines, what have you, that's when these kind of xenophobic, racist fears become dominant, you know, in the, in the media and the fear that what are these yellow men, these Chinamen going to do to our precious white women, you know, luring them into opium addiction and turning them into sex slaves in our opium dens. Same thing with cocaine, right? Cocaine widely used. Coca-Cola had cocaine in it until 1900. So far as we know, the problems with Coca-Cola addiction in the 1890s were no worse with cocaine in it than they are now with caffeine in it. Right. But when cocaine gets to be perceived with deviant groups and especially with blacks in the South and the fear that these black men would snort this white powder and forget their proper place in society and go out and do bad things to our precious white women. That's when you get cocaine prohibitions and ditto with cannabis. Right. You know, it wasn't a big deal. But when it gets linked in the popular imagination with Mexican-Americans, Mexican migrants in the Southwest, in the West, in the second and third decades of the 20th century, that's when you get the cannabis prohibitions. So that's you have some kind of early stages of the war on drugs going on. Although back then, of course, the big war on drugs was alcohol, alcohol prohibition, the temperance movement, the 18th Amendment banning alcohol in 1919 and then the whole revolt against 
against that, leading to the only amendment in American history to be repealed, you know, alcohol prohibition by the 21st Amendment in 1933. So we had these periodic wars on drugs. The one that people oftentimes point to is Richard Nixon declaring 50 years ago drugs being public enemy number one. And that was, you know, there were concerns around heroin, but it was also part of his, you know, fears around the hippies and weed and LSD and Timothy Leary and all this sort of stuff. And that was the beginnings of the war on drugs. But then when in the 70s, there's this little period where everybody gets chill. And that's the period when I come of age, right? I'm only 12 when the 60s end, but I'm graduating college at the end of the 70s. And I remember being in college in the late 70s, you know, and I went first to McGill in Montreal, then to Harvard. And, you know, it was cool. People would get high. Nobody was all flipped out. Cocaine was kind of around, but it wasn't a big issue. There was this kind of sensible period. Jimmy Carter proposes, you know, a federal law decriminalizing marijuana. People are talking sense. But then what happens is, um, you know, an anti-parents movement starts up in the late 70s. Uh, There are legitimate concerns about like one in 10 high school kids getting high every day. And nobody likes, you know, high school kids waking and bacon. And so you have the beginnings, the Democrats starting getting fearful. And then Reagan comes in and Reagan starts to pick up on the war on drugs and the rhetoric and see the political advantage because and being able to kind of, you know, the dog whistles, you know, connecting it with fear around black people and crime without actually sounding outright like a racist. Uh, And then, you know, and then and then crack cocaine, 1980s, Len Bias, a famous basketball player, dies of a cocaine overdose. And then there's a bipartisan, like, let's step up the penalties. And that's 1986 is when I really begin to date the modern era of the war on drugs. And that's penalties for selling or for possessing or for, for both, for all Matt. Things. You know, okay. for both. I mean, it's basically what happens is that's when you, they start to introduce penalties at the federal level and the states do the same thing of basically saying cocaine possession can put you into prison. Maybe we'll give you a shot at treatment, but if you don't stop, you're going to prison and you get penalties for, you know, sometimes one, but sometimes five years, even more for simple cocaine possession of small amounts. And for people selling it, they're introducing penalties of 10, 20 years. You know, I mean, it, it's crazy. In, by the late 1980s, I mean, it is the number one, 50 percent of Americans in public opinion polls are saying drugs is the number one threat to America. I mean, it's that sort of craziness. And marijuana, which everybody getting chill about, and it's getting tied up in the whole war on cocaine. And it's not just older people, it's younger people, right? In the late 70s, I think 50 percent of all college freshmen were in favor of legalizing marijuana. By the late 80s, it's down to 16 percent. So, you know, I started teaching at Princeton in 1987, and I can't, I'm amazed at how conservative of my kids are when they're, they're taking a seminar with me on drug policy and half of them have never even smoked a joint. I mean, it, it's a whole transition what goes on. And when I use the phrase McCarthyism on steroids, well, you think like, you know, McCarthyism was about the fear of communism, right? The fear of the Russians invading us, the fear of communist spies. But the fact of the matter is the Russians were not lapping at our borders and there was not a communist spy under every bed. But you could persuade Americans to become hysterical and engage in these witch hunts where people would be fired for past associations or not signing up to loyalty oaths. Well, War on drugs, yes, there was a real problem with drugs coming from abroad and people getting addicted. And yes, there was a problem with drug dealers domestically and a fears around kids. But in point of fact, the realities of the issue, it was not the kind of threat that was being depicted in the popular imagination. And what happened is you had right-wing Republicans, most notoriously the first drug czar, a guy named William Bennett, you know, under the first President Bush, who see uh, this is a vehicle in which the right-wing can play on the fears of middle class American parents and get them to embrace these draconian policies. And the Democrats, who don't want to be accused of being soft on crime or soft on drugs, and some of the old timers, most especially a a famous Democrat back then, Tip O'Neill, the Massachusetts liberal congressman who was Speaker of the House, you know, they all join on board. So we get this bipartisan war on drugs, and all of a sudden, America's prison population, which had been sort of around the global average back in the 70s, it goes from 500,000 people behind bars in 1980 to 2.3 million 
by the early 2000s. We have 4% of the world's population. We got 20 for, or 20% of the world's incarcerated population. We're locking up black people in a way that makes South Africa under apartheid look like nothing. We're competing with the Soviet gulags when it comes to rates of incarceration of, of black people, right? So we embrace this policy of, of, of drug testing the entire society, try, trying to do drug testing in schools, the workplace, firing people not for being high on job, but just for having smoked a joint over the weekend. We're locking up people ruthlessly. We're treating drug dealers as if they were rapists and murderers. So that's the war on drugs that, you know, and that's the thing I've been spending much of my life trying to repeal and roll back ever since. And, and you've spoken with some very interesting people for your show, Psychoactive, on this very topic. And, you know, I don't want to focus too hard in on the war on drugs because there's so many things we could discuss here. But I think maybe maybe your discussion with Larry Krasner, the the D.A., I think he's the D.A. in Philadelphia. Is yep. that correct? That's right. Um, you guys had he had some interesting things to say and you guys actually had some background um, just about how as a district attorney, you can help to shape how some of these laws, even if they're on the books, how they're actually enforced. Can you just tell me a little bit about what you guys discussed when it comes to our, the current, you know, how some of these drug laws are enforced right now? Yeah, well, I mean, I'll tell you, Matt, you know, we oftentimes people say, you know, follow the money and that'll explain the drug war. And, you know, there's some truth to that. I mean, private prison corporations and, you know, prison guards unions are fighting for their jobs and, and, you know, police departments wanting more money and all this sort of stuff. But actually, the most venal element of the war on drugs has oftentimes been the prosecutors, the district attorneys, the U.S. attorneys, right, the federal and state and local prosecutors. And that's not about money. That's about power. You know, and that's about power in terms of, you know, the more the tougher the laws are, the more you can coerce low level, you know, people who are picked up on drug possession or low level dealing to plead guilty, sometimes even if they're not. Right. I mean, the more also in terms of that interpersonal relationship between the prosecutor and the defense attorney, I mean, it just grossly shifts the balance of power. A lot of prosecutors want to run for public office. And so, you know, getting on the whole drug war bandwagon is great for them. And so they have really been so. Some of the most unaccountable champions of the war on drugs, worse than the police chiefs, worse than any right wing drudges, worse than you name it. Right. And Larry Krasner, the, the Philadelphia D.A., is really one of the leaders in a new wave of progressive prosecutors basically saying the drug war is bullshit filling our jails and prisons with tons of low-level people engaged in low-level crimes of, you know, drug selling doesn't make any sense. We need to treat the drug issue primarily as a health issue. Law enforcement is not a key part of the solution. And so Larry Krasner has very bravely been doing this in Philadelphia, and I was delighted because a lot of these progressive, progressive prosecutors, when they start moving forward, you know, if there's all of a sudden a spike in crime, you know, they could get elected out of office. But Krasner, you know, easily won re-election in Philadelphia, you know, fairly recently. So, you know, he's a good guy. I mean, some of the other guests, like, you know, Senator Schumer, he was one of the real drug warriors, but now we see him kind of co-sponsoring a marijuana legalization bill. Or the the head of the National Institute on Drug Abuse, who's been there for like 18 years, Nora Volkow, I really saw her as kind of a kind of kinder, gentler face of the drug war establishment, you know, who had run away from me, I mean, in, in all our previous encounters, but now she was willing to be on the show because things are changing, right? So there is this evolution with good guys like Krasner and other prosecutors like him and police chiefs stepping up and saying we need a different way. And then some of the old bad guys beginning to change their tune because the public is changing. We're going to pause for a word from our sponsors and we'll return with more from Ethan Nadelman. And we're back. So you have been working tirelessly for for decades to change these prohibitive uh, draconian policies. And we do know that the conversation has shifted uh, overall, right? At least at least for uh, some time and in some parts of the U.S., And one thing that we alluded to at the very beginning of our conversation today uh, is the idea that this ultimately, this war on drugs is a war that has serious consequences outside 
of the U.S. Uh, in Psychoactive, you spoke with uh, Juan Manuel Santos, former president of Colombia. And that conversation, I think, is astonishingly eye-opening for a lot of people who only think of this in domestic terms. What do you see other people, residents of other countries, uh, what, what do you see as their perception of the U.S.'s war on drugs? Well, I'll tell you, it's evolved over time, Ben. I mean, if you look at the United States, you know, we have been the global champion of the war on drugs from early in the 20th century until more or less the second term of President Obama. You know, it was as if we felt that having embraced the war on drugs in our own country, we needed to proselytize it to everybody else. And we justify it by saying that most of these drugs are being exported from abroad, heroin, cocaine, and much of the marijuana, even much of the methamphetamine. So we got to crack down, protect our borders, blame foreign countries, you know, use carrots and sticks to get them to change their ways in terms of drug production and drug export to the United States. But there was another element, some element of almost kind of like like it almost by, by forcing others to embrace our way of dealing with drugs, our highly punitive, abstinence-only, prohibitionist, war on drugs approach, it was almost like helping to legitimize our own approach in our own eyes. If we get everybody else to do it through persistent pressure, it would somehow make it more legit. And so we played a pivotal role in really, you know, you know, making this a global drug prohibition regime, where all sorts of countries which had never even heard of marijuana or never seen cocaine, we ended up prohibiting them and criminalizing them, not even barely knowing what they were. And then 20, 30 years later, all of a sudden they're having to deal with black markets or their own people using these things through a criminal lens rather than a regulatory health lens, right? I remember back when I got going, late 80s, early 90s, I'd go down to Mexico, Colombia, Peru, uh, you know, you name it. And these countries, they just felt stuck between a rock and a hard place. On the one hand, it was clear that the illicit drug markets were essentially global commodities markets like coffee, like sugar, like tea, like precious metals, like you name it. And that so long as there's a demand, there's going to be a supply. And that there's no way to stop that. And the notion of putting law enforcement officials in charge of trying to stop a dynamic global commodities market just made no sense and was a recipe for creating huge criminal organizations and vast black markets and corruption and violence and all of that, right? On the other hand, they had the U.S. government saying, you better do it our way or we're going to penalize you. We're going to cut off your exports. We're going to send, you know, police and maybe even soldiers. We're going to hurt you in all sorts of ways. So they were really stuck. They were stuck. And I think there was a pivotal moment that happened really, um, I think, after we won the ballot initiatives to legalize marijuana in Colorado and Washington in 2012. And, you know, Obama had previously promised that he wanted to really start to roll back the war on drugs. And he wasn't willing to do it in the first term because they saw it as too politically risky. But once we won in Colorado and Washington, it put the federal government in a tough spot. And at that point, they, you know, they said, what are we going to do here? It's illegal under federal law, but Colorado and Washington legalized. So they said, we're going to let those states implement their legalization. And if they can make it work, who are we, the feds, to object? And at that point, that led to a series of events where the United States stopped being the global champion of the war on drugs. We essentially handed off the baton to the Russians, who love being the, the global champion of the war on drugs. And now Biden, who was probably the least good on the drug issue among all the Democrats in the primaries back in 2020, um, you know, so he's no great friend of drug policy reform. But even under him, we see, you know, at least some progress where the U.S. is no longer a robust global champion of the war on drugs. Other countries can breathe a bit. The European model with all of its harm reduction approaches, treating drugs as a health issue, has more chance to flex its muscles and be embraced in other countries. So we are fortunately seeing an evolution in recent years. But I got to tell you, I'm ashamed. I would I would travel around the world and I'd start off my speeches by saying I want to apologize to you as an American citizen for the harms that our country's war on drugs has done in this country. Well, thanks for doing that as our representative. Uh, it's very kind of you. Um, <laughs> I, I want to talk about where the war on terror meets the war on drugs. In my mind, I first encountered this with Ben, gosh, maybe 10 years ago when we made a video on this, Ben, on Afghanistan and the opium trade. And um, 
there were just stories coming out about soldiers protecting opium fields. And we had just learned, you know, we had been learning quite a bit at that time just about the military's involvement, you know, with both the war on drugs, uh, fighting the war on drugs and perhaps a few key, a few small groups of people doing some other things with drugs when they're uh, <laughs> funding, you know, gr- other groups with the sale of drugs and things like that. Uh, but when I think back to that time, I have this very clear picture of soldiers protecting poppy fields in the opium trade because it was very valuable both to the people of Afghanistan and for, you know, potentially for the for the government and the purposes of the military being active in Afghanistan. When you spoke with David Mansfield, my my view of that changed quite a bit um, because of his experiences. I just wonder what your takeaway from that conversation was. Yeah, well, I mean, David Mansfield's, you know, probably the world's leading expert on drugs in Afghanistan. Um, but I'll tell you, Matt, it's a complicated story because essentially, you know, for the United States, fighting drugs has Although it's been a huge thing rhetorically, in reality, it's always been a secondary concern compared to, first of all, fighting communism from the 50s until, you know, the late 90s, early 2000s, and then fighting the war on terror after 2001, right? And so what would happen is that if, I mean, and there's a wonderful book about this by a a University of Wisconsin professor, Alfred McCoy, called The Politics of Heroin in Southeast Asia, which sets the context for your question about Afghanistan, which is that what would happen is, go back to Southeast Asia. You know, there, the United States was fighting in the 60s and early 70s. We were fighting against communist guerrillas in Vietnam and Laos and Cambodia, what have you. And many of our allies there were these other, you know, indigenous, you know, tribes and other organizations that were anti-communist. And sometimes the best anti-communist fighters, right, were the people who were also involved in the illicit drug activity. And so what happened in Southeast Asia is that, you know, the CIA oftentimes, sometimes the military, more from the CIA, you know, they would be shipping weapons up to our anti-communist allies in parts of Laos, you know, Vietnam, what have you. And then when those planes came back filled with opium or heroin to Saigon to be exported to the U.S. and other parts around the world, well, U.S. intelligence would just turn a blind eye to that. Right. Because the greater objective was fighting communism. Same thing happened in, you know, Central America, the Contras back in the 80s. -hmm. Right. Once again, fighting the communists. So when our Contra allies would get involved in drugs to help fund their activities, you know, you know, the CIA, sometimes the DEA would be going after those guys and the CIA would intervene (laughs) and say, wait a second, those drug traffickers, they're the best allies we have in fighting the communists. And this would even happen in small. Exactly. And this would even happen in smaller ways going on in, you know, parts of Latin America, South America. And Afghanistan, of course, was the great example of that. Because, you know, under the when the Taliban were first in power in the late 90s, early 2000s, our greatest ally in fighting the communists was deeply implicit, you know, in, in, implicated in the in the opium trade, in the heroin trade, the guy who was assassinated by the Taliban right before 9-11. And so it was once again kind of saying, hey, we got priorities here. Now, part of the one consequence of this is that you would have some people in the United States, especially uh, black politicians, Maxine Waters from California and others, who would say, the reason we have a drug problem in America is because of the CIA. They're sending crack cocaine into our ghettos, or decades ago, they're sending heroin into our ghettos. And what I would point out to them is, yes, the CIA is complicit. It is true. But even if the CIA had been squeaky clean, Crack cocaine would have shown up just a few months later in Los Angeles, in New York, or what have you, or heroin would have shown up just way, because ultimately these are global commodities markets, and any role the CIA is playing with our, you know, anti-communist or anti-terrorist allies in, um, in Afghanistan or, or Vietnam or Mexico through the years, it's, it's a tiny, it's a drop in the ocean compared to the bigger dynamics at play here. So it's always been a complicated story. It doesn't justify the U.S. being involved involved in being complicit in drug trafficking. But I think it's important to put it into that context there. Yeah, I think that's a I think that's a an important point and one that needs to be brought up more often. Uh, the the sad reality often seems to be that 
people, when hearing a narrative, want want an easy, cut and dried story of villains and heroes, uh, rather than the you know much more realistic story of competing and sometimes uh, complementary interest. Right, the the old strange bedfellows situations that occur so often in the world of geopolitics. This leads us to one of the questions I'm very excited to ask you, uh, as as the world's foremost expert on drug policy, we've entered the realm of a little bit of myth busting because we know that the the story of drugs in the U.S. is often riddled with uh, alarming accusations. Right. With conspiracy theories, Uh, we've already mentioned two of the most popular, the idea that the CIA purposely flooded disadvantaged neighborhoods with cocaine, sort of steepling their fingers, Monty Burns style the whole time. And with with this in mind, we have to ask, are any of the conspiratorial things people hear about drugs and prohibition, do any of them, in your opinion, have some sand? I'm, I'm thinking particularly about accusations of, for profit motivations, which you mentioned. Um, I think also one of the big ones that we've yet to address is the possible role of legal drug manufacturers, pharmaceutical companies, you know, the, um, the Purdue's, uh, the, the Sackler family kind of operations, I guess what I'm asking is, Ethan, is, is any of that real? Like the accusations that big pharma is, quote unquote, doing this. I mean, Ben, I'll tell you, it, it's complicated, right? So, so let's just take big pharma as one example, and then I'll turn to another. Um, you know, back in the late 80s, an organization emerged called the Partnership for a Drug-Free America, And they were obsessed about marijuana use among young people. Now, interestingly, in their early years, they were funded by big alcohol, big tobacco, and big pharma, right? Now, ultimately, they were embarrassed to stop taking money from big alcohol and big tobacco. But And the guy who was the head of that organization was a, a fellow named Jim Burke, who had been the head of was the head of Johnson and Johnson, the famous pharmaceutical company, who was a hero. He was when when they went through a little scandal with this tainted Tylenol call, killing people. The way he handled that, his crisis management, that became a role model that he would teach in Harvard Business School for how to deal with crisis management. So he was one of the most powerful people in America, in the corporate world, and in that kind of you know you know wasp establishment in America. And but he be but he was you know anti head of the Partnership for Drug Free America, the chair of it, and it seemed to be all all about demonizing marijuana because, you know, if you Googled, or you couldn't Google back then, late 80s, early 90s, but if you looked around on drugs, what would pop up is drugs, meant heroin, cocaine, marijuana, methamphetamine, LSD, but drugs also meant everything Big Pharma was producing. And so they had a kind of marketing issue, which how do we distinguish our good drugs, our okay drugs from those bad drugs? So the Partnership for Drug-Free America became entirely focused on marijuana. They entirely ignored the issues with pharmaceuticals problems. They downplayed the issues with alcohol, at least in their earlier years, right? So you had that part, you know. Now, I didn't see them putting big money. I mean, they never actually put big money into opposing our marijuana legalization initiatives, but they would get involved in trying to figure out, you know, like, how do we slow the pace of this reform here? Now you move forward to the Sackler family and Purdue Pharma, which became notorious for its, you know, grossly inappropriate promotion of OxyContin. OxyContin was a new formulation of an opioid that was a miracle drug for people struggling with pain, but when it's marketed to people with chronic pain, created a big problem. And I interviewed both the author of the book, Empire of Pain, Patrick Radden Keefe, about his book about the Sackler family, but also Kate Nicholson, who started an organization, you know, to represent the interests of people who are using pain medications, pharmaceutical opioids responsibly, but now can't get them anymore because doctors are afraid to prescribe them because there's, the pendulum has swung so far the other direction. And so there what I say is, you know, the Sackler family and especially, you know, the key people involved with Purdue Pharma and that organization, they deserve the blame they're getting. They deserve to be punished, put out of business, penalize, you know, maybe even go to jail. They deserve that because of their gross overpromotion of this stuff. But as you said, Ben, people want to have the easy enemy. So all of a sudden, the Sacklers Purdue Pharma 
represents the entire face of the opioid epidemic. But in point of fact, they have not been a major part of the problem for the last 10 or 15 years. You know, the problem then became heroin, and now it's about fentanyl being imported illegally from China and Mexico. Um, You know, and, and then, I mean, so there's a kind of gross distortion. So the Sacklers, who deserve... 20% of the blame or Purdue Pharma are being given 90% of the blame. And that distracts us from what's really going on. And then I'll just point out one other example. I mean, there is probably no more demonized and appropriately demonized force out there in the kind of global capitalist world than big tobacco, right? I mean, those lied, cheated, sold their cancer sticks, addicted teenagers, came up with more addictive cigarettes. I mean, you name it, right? So, I mean, absolutely a despicable business that, you know, basically ends up killing their most loyal consumers, right? You know, after making a huge amount of money from them. But now we're this interesting moment where some of the big tobacco companies are getting deeply involved in developing e-cigarettes and these what are called these heat not burn devices. Well, it turns out these are ways of consuming nicotine that present a tiny fraction of the risks of cigarettes. In fact, if you could snap your fingers, you know, and tomorrow the, the, the 40 million Americans who smoke cigarettes or the billion plus people around the world who smoke cigarettes were to suddenly stop smoking cigarettes and every single one of them were to start vaping and using e-cigarettes or juuling or whatever, it would be one of the greatest advances in public health history, in public health, in, in the history of the world. And that would even be true if far more young people were vaping, you know, than, 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 had, than had been smoking. Smoking. But most Americans don't know that. So big tobaccos become a very complicated figure where they're still selling their cancer sticks. They're still making money there. But some of them are trying to make a real transition to selling nicotine in far, far dramatically less dangerous forms. But once again, our need for simple answers and simple enemies is standing in the way of an effective public health approach. Oh, simple answers and simple enemies. <laughs> yeah. It describes so much uh, of what we cover on this show. Um, I, you're making me think about propaganda. I just I, I crafted this question. I'm going to ask it the way I, I wrote it out, just because I was kind of proud of it, Ethan. Um, <laughs> but it's basically what you've already said. I just I want to see if you got a different answer when it comes out this way. Um, while there are several ways to affect the laws governing this democratic republic, in my opinion, the second most effective maneuver is to change the way a majority of the voting populace thinks. Uh, so for better or for worse, uh, that means deploying some form of propaganda, at least to my mind over the course of your career. How have you seen propaganda most effectively deployed from both sides of the war on drugs? Well, that's a great question, Matt. Um, I mean, when I look at the propaganda on the drug war side, they were just extraordinarily successful in the 80s and 90s. I mean, they managed to take an innocuous substance like marijuana, not totally innocuous. I mean, you know, people can get addicted to it. People can have problems with it. So, you know, I, I know people have had serious marijuana problems, but the vast majority don't. Um, and for the vast majority, it's probably a net positive in their lives, right? But somehow, Nancy Reagan gets up there with her just say no and saying the most dangerous drug user in America is a teenage marijuana smoker who's doing well in school, basically, because they set, send the wrong message to everybody else. So they really, their propaganda, the ones who believed in, you know, instituting a system of mass incarceration and blaming everything on drugs, you know, I mean, they, their success in in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s, I mean, I think a lot of people are now in their teens and 20s don't even appreciate how venal and effective that campaign was. I mean, it would literally be if you took 10 scientific questions about drugs, about the relative risks or about what happened or this and that, and you asked ordinary Americans you know, they would get the majority of the answers wrong simply because the media was so, so and the media, everybody, I mean, it, it was just everything they believed was basically false. 
right? I mean, you know, that, that, but you use a drug once, you become instantly addicted. False for the 99.9% of all people, you know? You know, opiates, the fact that if you have a legal secure supply of heroin, you can consume that and live to be 90 years old and hold a job, right? It's more about black market heroin and adulterated heroin. I mean, people didn't know that. You know, marijuana does these things to your body. LSD, you know, harms your chromosomes. MDMA drains your spinal fluid. I mean, these were front page news stories where people would get freaked out about this stuff and it was all bullshit or or 99 or 90 percent bullshit. You know, that marijuana is a stepping stone, you know, to to using other getting in trouble with other drugs. Well, I describe that as an ounce of truth embedded in a pound of bullshit. Right. And now we're seeing the same misinformation around the issues of vaping nicotine as opposed to cigarettes, where a majority of Americans believe that e-cigarettes and vaping is as or more dangerous than smoking cigarettes when it's diametrically opposite, in which a majority of doctors believe that nicotine is what causes cancer when nicotine doesn't cause cancer. It's the combustible elements of the cigarette that cause, that cause cancer, right? So their propaganda, both then and now the modern day stuff that we're seeing around vaping and even somewhat around the role of opioids in pain management, you know, it's just horrific propaganda that helps explain a big part of the American war on drugs and why we've had such a problem not just with mass incarceration, but why we have 100,000 people dying of overdoses today. Now, if you ask on our side, where have we been most successful? Hey, man, we don't do propaganda. We're just all about the evidence, about the science. <laughs> but I'll, I'll, I'll tell you this. Um, I think, you know, there was a mo- one of the things we did um, that I think was very effective was that we were, we were smart about our messaging. You know, uh, already almost 25 years ago, we did some uh, uh, focus groups and public opinion testing, and we realized that most Americans, the word legalized to them meant something being out of control. Whereas when we meant legalization, we meant regulation. And we realized that using the phrase of tax control, regulate, and educate was the way to reassure people in the middle that what legalization was was a responsible regulatory approach. And then, you know, I remember, you know, back in, this is about 10 years ago, different groups, my organization, other organizations, we each had sometimes different views about what would be the most powerful message. You know, some people said that it's about personal freedom. Some people said it's about marijuana being safer than alcohol. Some people said it's about the medical value, right? But what we all agreed on was that, Say whatever you want to say, but come Labor Day, two months before Election Day, when we were going to have an initiative on the ballot, we would all stop our own favored messaging and we would rely on the messaging that the polling told us was going to work best to persuade the fearful soccer mom, the person in the middle, right, the the American parent who maybe used marijuana when they are younger, who was kind of scared, but knew marijuana prohibition didn't work. And those two messages were, hey... We'd rather have the cops focusing on real crime instead of going after young people for marijuana. And we'd rather have the government taxing and regulating this stuff instead of giving all the money to the gangsters. And that message discipline, which was, you know, true in most states, really helped us move forward. Now, you know, we're in this little kind of sweet spot right now where there's almost there's remarkably little negative stuff coming out about marijuana. I mean, it's almost as if it's, you know, with with the mass commercialization, with marijuana emerging in liquid forms and chocolate forms and this and that, and, and the medical value being more and more appreciated. But we're in this period where I see it beginning to swell up now, where we're going to see the pendulum begin to swing and people are going to start talking about the harms of marijuana again and the dangers of marijuana and bringing back both some of the science, which is true about some risks of marijuana, but also some of the propaganda. It's why I was very reassured when just recently the annual survey of of drug use came out and it showed that marijuana use among adolescents dropped more last year than almost any year in decades. So notwithstanding the broad legalization and commercialization, you know, and notwithstanding the the fact that marijuana use among people my age is increasing dramatically, marijuana use among adolescents keeps dropping. So as long as that stays the case, I think we're in a sweet spot. But at some point, because this goes up and down, irrespective of public policy, you know, adolescents are going to get into weed again, and we're going to see an increase, and then we'll see the uh, anti-drug propaganda reemerging. Yes, save the, save the children. <laughs> 
<laughs> that's a that's a that's a heck of an effective message, right? Regardless. Well, you know, right. I mean, so often the entire war on drugs has been justified as one great big child protection act. And now when we look at the opposition to e-cigarettes, right, where we know that, you know, smokers in their 30s, 40s, 50s and 60s switching to e-cigarettes could dramatically, you know, cut you know, tobacco-related deaths. But hey, what about the kids? They've been juuling. They've been doing this stuff. And even though the risks to them are dramatically, dramatically less than the harms to adult smokers, hey, man, it's all about the kids. If a million adults got to die prematurely so that we can keep a bunch of kids from vaping, hey, that's a price worth paying. So we're we're seeing the old drug war rhetoric now connecting to these issues around tobacco, vaping, and cigarettes. And with that, we're going to take a quick moment to hear a word from our sponsor, but we'll be right back with Ethan Nadelman. And we've returned. I'd like to talk uh, briefly about something that that I personally take as good news. When we're talking about evolving policy, uh, one of the things that we've mentioned in the past on this show is that a clear, um, a clear and deleterious effect of prohibitive drug policies is that they can stymie research into possible benefits of a substance, or even just learning more about something, and that that applies to marijuana. Uh, for a long time, uh, but it also applies to psilocybin, to psych- these these psychoactive or hallucinogenic rather substances. And in the past few weeks, or you know, in the past few years, but uh, I, w- I was just reading the news a, a few weeks ago, up to a few days ago. It seems that there has been a lot of progress in the research front on the possible benefits. Uh, the possible benefits of psychoactive substances, and this is this is pretty solid methodology. It appears to me. I'm not the expert. I wasn't involved in the studies. Um, uh, you know, I I have a I understand what they're talking about. You study I guess, them in the other best. ways, shall we say? Yes, perhaps. Yes, that's that's the most diplomatic way. Thank you. Um, but I wanted to I wanted to ask you uh, specifically. About this, because I I know there's a lot of um, a lot of people struggle to find optimism in in the like the situation that we have been in as a nation for so long. Uh, there are a lot of there there are a lot of dangerous and and terrible things that have happened uh, as a result of prohibitive policies. So, what do we see as the future? of psychedelics. I'm asking specifically because I I just read that um, someone in New York has filed a bill to legalize medical psilocybin. Do you think these kinds of things will pass? Will, Will psilocybin become kind of like, will it assume the role that marijuana currently has in the future? Well, not quite marijuana, Ben, but it's a great question. I mean, there is truly a psychedelic renaissance going on right now. And most of these substances, psilocybin, also mescaline, I mean, psilocybin is the key ingredient in mushrooms, mescaline is the key ingredient in peyote and the San Pedro plant, then there's LSD, then there's MDMA, ecstasy, which is not really a psychedelic, but, you know, sometimes people group it in that category. And then there's 5-MeO-DMT, which is what they call the toad medicine. Uh, you know, it's another powerful thing. So those are just some of the examples. Um, so there's an incredible, really a psychedelic renaissance going on right now, and I'm just blown away by it. I was just at a couple of conferences on psychedelics in business and then psychedelics in the movements, both in Miami and New York in the recent months. And even though these drugs are in what's called Schedule One in most cases, I'm not ketamine. Ketamine's the one legal sort of psychedelic that we have ketamine clinics popping up and it's legally regulated. And so that's the one short acting quasi psychedelic that's out there. But, you know, Schedule One. What that means is that the government has said that there's no legitimate medical uses and great harm associated with this drug. And, you know, ridiculously, marijuana remains in Schedule 1. So it points out what a farce the entire scheduling system is and how highly politicized it is. I mean, that, you know, and I think in a way that farce helped us in our marijuana legalization efforts because, you know, here we're winning these ballot initiatives on medical marijuana back in the 90s and 2000s. And the government's saying there's no such thing as medical marijuana. 
marijuana. And, be, you know, over a third of Americans know people personally are using marijuana medically. So the fact that the government was lying helped to delegitimize their case and helped us, I think, ultimately move forward with legalizing marijuana and winning support. Now, with the psychedelics, it is technically possible to do research on Schedule One drugs. I mean, there's even been research giving heroin to human subjects going on in the past at Columbia and Johns Hopkins and at Wayne State in Michigan. So it's possible. And what you've now seen happening is more and more private companies, or in a key case, an organization called MAPS, Multidisciplinary Associated Psychedelic Studies, that have been moving forward with the FDA getting permission to do these research studies. Right. And so we're now seeing that MDMA is probably going to be approved by the FDA for treatment of PTSD at roughly two years from now. And we're also seeing that psilocybin, the ingredient in mushrooms, is probably going to be approved by the FDA for treatment of intractable depression maybe a year or two after that. Right. So that's going to cause them to be rescheduled. Um, So we are seeing some evolution. And meanwhile, there are dozens of studies, mostly funded now more with private investment capital than with foundation support, you know, that are moving forward, especially in the U.S. and Canada, a few in Europe, right? And finally, just a few months ago, the National Institute on Drug Abuse, for the first time in like 40 or 50 years, just approved a grant to Johns Hopkins for a study giving psilocybin and seeing if it helps people stop smoking. So I think we're going to see more federal funding in this area as well. So on the one hand, there's this kind of medicalization approach that's going through the FDA or its European equivalents that is really showing this incredible promise. And there are, you know, you look at the, some of these companies out, the company doing the psilocybin research, Compass, has a, a stock market valuation of like a billion and a half dollars. And one of the major investment funds, you know, also a billion and a half dollars. And another company that's doing, setting up retreats and clinics, you know, is valued at a half a billion. So this is a rapidly growing area, both of small startup firms and of companies going public. And I think this is going to continue. I mean, there'll be mistakes made and there'll be some pushback, but the media coverage is fantastic. Then there's that second track that you mentioned, the decriminalization track. Right. That's what was started when Denver decriminalized, uh, uh, you know, uh, psilocybin possession, I think it was a few years ago. And then the, the city of Oakland did the same thing. And more recently, Detroit did it in the most recent election. And then Oregon, remarkably, last year passed two major ballot initiatives. One was one that my organization, Drug Policy Alliance, under the leadership of my successors, you know, had introduced, and that was to decriminalize possession of all drugs, including heroin, cocaine, and methamphetamine, where people essentially would not go to jail for possession of small amounts. But the other one was a psychedelics initiative that basically said possession is decriminalized and that the state of Oregon should move forward with allowing people to be prescribed psilocybin or or psilocybin not just for serious illness, but even for general mental health and well-being. And so what we're going to see now is more of that psychedelics reform moving forward through ballot initiatives in other states. It might be Washington, California, Colorado, you name it. You know, typically the Western states go first. Or it might be legislation like the one in New York that you mentioned, you know, where it's beginning to move forward. So these two tracks, the decriminalization and the legitimization of regulated, you know, access to these drugs in a quasi-medical environment and clinics, and on the other hand, the medical, very medical environment, I mean, there's amazing momentum behind these things. I cannot claim much credit because, you know, I, although personally psychedelics have played a very important role in my own life, in my organization, we were only involved at the edges of this. And far more credit goes to, you know, Rick Doblin, who founded the Multidisciplinary Associated Psychedelic Studies, MAPS, back in uh, the 80s and has led this effort and to other researchers, uh, you know, at major universities and now to some of the investors who are obviously trying to make money, but taking some real risk to get this stuff moving forward. And of course, the philanthropists. Like Soros. No, I'm just Actually, <laughs> Soros, you know, you know, it's funny when I talked to George about the psychedelic stuff a long time ago. And Matt, I got to tell you, uh, just a funny story here. So back, um, uh, it must have been 2015, 
2015, I think it was, and I organized a fundraising dinner um, at Soros's apartment, right? And I had there, you know, some of our biggest donors. One of them was Sean Parker, you know, from Facebook fame and all that. And another one was a guy named John Morgan, a very controversial guy in Florida who's been a big Democratic Party contributor. And then one of Soros's sons was there and some other major people from investment banks and things like that. And, and there was this lull in the conversation. And, and so just for the hell of it, I don't know what got into me. I said to them, you'll never guess where I was last week. And they said, where? I said, the World Ayahuasca Congress in Ibiza. And they said, the World What Congress? <laughs> the Ayahu? The what? Right? And, you know, they had no idea what I was talking about. And then mm-hmm. at that point, George's son jumps, jumps in and he goes, you know, Dad, or actually calls him George, you know, you have no idea how many ayahuasca sessions are happening in Brooklyn and in Manhattan every weekend. Right? So George, you know, he and the key staff were never much into this. But fortunately, one of the key people working within the foundation, a good friend of mine, Kasia Melanowska, she's been sympathetic to this. So we've begun to see a limited amount of funding coming out of Soros' foundation, very, very small, um, for cyclist reform. I'm not even sure George knows about it, um, but it's, uh, but it's <laughs> definitely incredible. helping. You know, and, and from their angle, it's putting the money in on the social justice side, right? So it's about the role of indigenous people and making sure they're protected. It's about trying to introduce some racial justice elements in the psychedelics world. So that's really the, the focus of his foundation on this stuff. But it, it's tiny compared to everything else. <laughs> I wonder how many of those stories you have. Just (laughs) weird connections and then drugs jump in somewhere. (laughs) I'm mad. I got to tell you, it's true. I mean, also, you know, from from the left wing to the right wing and foreign presidents and dignitaries and media. It's funny. It's true. These stories keep pouring out. And, uh, you know, one day day I'll write a book about it, I guess, is, is the common expression that one gives about this. Although I'll tell you, one of the joys about doing this podcast, Psychoactive, is that in each of the episodes, I get to tell some of these stories, you know, because I'm having guests on and, you know, I'll have uh, somebody who wrote a, a Pulitzer Prize winning book about the drug war within the black community. And I can share my experiences with Jesse Jackson and Charlie Wrangell and others. Or, or, you know, Ben mentioned having the former Colombian president who won the Nobel Peace Prize, Juan Manuel Santos. But I've known him for a decade and can tell some of those stories. And so that, that's, that's one of the joys for me of doing the podcast. And this is one of the reasons that it was so important for us to to have you on the show today. And and first, uh, as we said at the very beginning, thank you so much for joining us because we want our our fellow listeners to learn more about these incredibly important issues, to learn the context, to learn the present, and to learn the future, uh, and to hopefully. And I will make this a call to action, hopefully, to join in creating that future, because as you as you point out, it does. It's this is uh, this is such a complex situation. There are a lot of factors involved. And I think everybody can agree that as a society, the U.S. could do a lot better. It's uh, the, the way a corporate America would would uh, probably phrase it is there are areas of opportunity. <laughs> and, yeah. uh, well, Ben, I'll tell you something. I mean, given especially the name of your podcast here, stuff they don't want you to know, you know, my one sort of parting piece of advice for your listeners is whenever you see a new drug scare, look again. Because the odds are it's wrong. Now, in the case of fentanyl and the overdoses, it's right. Fentanyl is deadly, and you got to be careful and not be mucking around, and it's even showing up in cocaine and other drugs like that. So there's some truth to it there, right? And so you do need to be aware. And it's a shame the government's been lying and deceiving so much that people sometimes fail to appreciate that. On the other hand, when you see the stuff now being said about opioids— And when you see the stuff being said about vaping of nicotine, you know, that stuff oftentimes is grossly exaggerated and oftentimes factually inaccurate. And the fact that the mainstream media, including the New York Times and others, are buying into this stuff, the fact that some of the worst offenders sometimes are not right-wing nutheads, but but left-wing progressive politicians who have generally been good about ending the war on drugs, but they jump on the bandwagon when it comes to new things around opioids or vaping. So I would just, you know, parting words was, you know, look carefully. If you're curious, look at the evidence and don't buy the initial bullshit because the willingness of even smart people or people who think they're smart and educated and have wisdom and are progressive to buy into mainstream bullshit 
is unlimited. But because we see ourselves as enlightened and progressive oftentimes, we think we're immune to that. But oftentimes, we're not. Very well said. Yeah. And the, uh, and we do have to we do have to do a little bit of uh, disclosure, I think, Matt. Uh, we are both big, big fans of Psychoactive. I, I'm tremendously impressed. Uh, I have learned so much just from tuning in. And Matt, you are also instrumental in the show. Uh, this is a this is a Matt Frederick production. What? I've never heard of this show before. I just met Ethan today. No, no. Uh, hey, well, yeah, I gotta sure. say, Matt, I was so psyched when you came to the launch party for Psychoactive in New York in the summer, and the, the look in your eyes and your enthusiasm when you were meeting some of these characters, I, 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 mean, I loved it. I loved it. No, it's true. Yeah, we were on a rooftop in New York City, and uh, the it is, they were characters in your life. But they're also highly influential people, mostly in, in the, the field of education, the people that I was speaking with, they were like uh, professors who've been working for ages just studying some of these topics and people who've been working their entire lives, you know, to advocate for the, some of the same things you're advocating for, Ethan. Um, it was very moving to be there. And yes, I am an executive producer on the show, but uh, I would just say everybody, if you get a chance, please listen it, some of the some of the most interesting and informative conversations around the topic of drug drugs exist in that show. And I'm very uncomfortable with drugs personally, and I don't use many, if at all. I have a vape uh, and I drink some alcohol every once in a while. But it's it's really changed the way I view the topic entirely. So thank you for making the show, Ethan, and please check it out, everybody. And, and I should just call you, know, many people have asked me, do I get high when I record the show? And the truth is I don't smoke marijuana because I find that if I use marijuana, it's hard to stay focused and remember what the previous question I asked was. So I never get high before. But I just recorded an episode about this drug Kratom, which is sold legally in most states yeah. in America. And in this case, I went out yesterday, I bought some Kratom, and I drank a glass of Kratom while I was interviewing my guest about the subject. So that was a bit of a new experience. So that's the new thing? You just do whatever <laughs> drug you're going to talk well, about? That it, 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 it's got to be a mild one because I'm not going to, you know, I was thinking I should, I probably should start microdosing before I do an episode on microdosing, but I keep forgetting to microdose. So, you know. <laughs> so another thing I enjoy, I, I fully agree with Matt's point about the tremendously important educational nature, but I also... Uh, I have to, I have to, a hundred percent confirm what you said earlier about these stories just come out of me. That's something I really enjoy in Psychoactive. And there was a Rolling Stone interview, I think it was Rolling Stone that you did, uh, where where you said when the laws had changed in New York, you and a friend like decided, oh, okay, we're gonna smoke a joint on the street, and there's the, there's a cop. Across the street. Oh, Ben, exactly. I'm walking with a friend. It's like the day or two after the New York law had passed. It's the first law in the country which allows people to smoke a joint in public. So we're in Central Park, and we can't smoke in Central Park because you're not allowed to smoke tobacco in Central Park. So I said, let's go outside. So we walk outside. It's on Fifth Avenue around 100th Street, right? And, and, and so there we're on a sidewalk. It's legal. And I'm across the street from Mount Sinai Hospital, which is actually where I was born. And there's a police car across the street. And I start to, and my friend goes, Ethan, what are you doing? I said, this is a cop car. I said, Howard, this is the meeting of freedom. And in fact, even if we were not two old white guys, but two young black men, we could still do it. So I, I feel very proud of that moment. It really brought home to me the kind of personal element of the freedom that we're fighting for and trying to end the war on drugs. There you have it, everyone. Check out Psychoactive. This has been Ethan Nadelman. <laughs> I'm just... <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I feel, you know, my only regret here is that we do eventually have to end this episode. Yeah. But that's not the end of the story. The story does continue in Psychoactive. Um, I would also like to highlight uh, for anybody interested in um, how is it phrased? The internationalization of criminal law enforcement. Uh, do check out the books that you have. Uh, you, you've created uh, cops across borders, policing the globe. Uh, the information that will empower people in this in this ongoing 
conversation. It's out there. It's available. Uh, and to your point, yes, there there are entities that consider that information the stuff they don't want you to know, which means that wherever wherever you fall personally, you should know it. <laughs> so Exactly. Well, guys, thanks so much for the opportunity to be on this with you. I, I, I love doing it. Matt, I appreciate your work on Psychoactive, and I appreciate this podcast. So, Ben, great to meet you as well. We cannot, uh, we cannot wait for the next episodes. We want to thank you for your time. And at this point, folks, we also want to pass the mic to you. What do you think is the future of drug policy, not just in the U.S., but in the world? What do you think of the what, what we call the long tail consequences of some of these prohibitive policies. Let us know. Uh, we try to be easy to find online. If you don't sip the social meds, you can give us a call at our phone number, one eight three three std wytk And if you want to send us an email, we read every single one we get. We can't wait to hear from you. All you have to do is drop us a line. We are conspiracy at iheartradio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.